Hello, Witch Enthusiasts. Now, today I'd like to speak about quite an interesting subject which was suggested to me by a viewer, and which uh, which really does, uh, does point to several points in the industry itself, which are rather interesting. And this is the question of comparing in-house movements with movements produced by a third party, so for example using a Salita, an ETA, or a Soprod movement in a watch instead. And it's an interesting point, because a lot of people associate in-house with higher quality, and this isn't always true, and, uh, and so I'd like to produce a video discussing what an in-house movement really means and what it is, but also its pros and cons in terms of accuracy, um, in terms of their features, but also in terms of technology incorporated into these movements, in addition to reliability, service prices, and of course just how spectacular the movement can be. Because I feel these are the general aspects which are important when buying a watch, and what you would consider when uh, when choosing the movement um, of the watch itself. Before I begin the video, though, I would just like to point out that what I'm speaking about in the video very much is generalisation, because there will inevitably be uh, be exceptions to the rules I, I I set out. But I'd like to try and include as much as possible in this video to try and give as complex an answer as possible, because I feel simply saying that one type of movement is better than the other is very single faceted and really doesn't represent the truth. Now, in order to best explain what an in-house movement is, I feel I should break the industry and the, the market of mechanical watch movements into three categories. Now, the first category of movements is the one which makes up the vast majority of the movements used by watchmakers in the industry. And these are third-party made movements. So these are movements which are manufactured um, and designed by the likes of ETA, Salita, or Soprod, amongst other movement uh, designers. Even, for example, Seiko movements, which are then sold to a, a watchmaker, would fall into this category. And uh, these can also um, be, be uh, assembled, decorated, and modified by the watchmaker, and in many cases very profoundly modified, but I would still class them as third-party movements, because that's their original base, um, and for the purposes of this video that works very well in terms of, of defining what they are. And, uh, of course, by saying this I'm not stating quality at all, as I'll explain later on in the video. The second category is that of in-house movements, and when I say in-house movements, the definition I'm going with is movements which are designed by or for a manufacturer exclusively. And by saying that, I mean that they are movements which don't share anything in terms of their design or their architecture with movements made for other companies. So whether they're made by the, um, the watchmaker or for the watchmaker, they have to be unique to that watchmaker and to their watches as opposed to being made for other manufacturers as well, or sharing the design or the build of those other movements. The third category, which is the most difficult to define, is that category in between the in-house and the, uh, the, the factory, or indeed the third-party made movements. And an example of this would be the Longines L688.2, because this is a movement which is made by ETA for Longines, but exclusively for Longines, which is based very, very closely on the Velitru 7750, except that it's had a very different chronograph module um, or section, um, because it now features a column wheel uh, engagement for the chronograph, and also has a different arrangement of the subdials. And whilst this, what this movement is unique to Longines, I would still class this as a third-party movement, because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a movement which, is, which still shares interchangeable parts with the Vedru 7750. By contrast, the movements made for Omega, for example, their, um, their, their 8800 line of coaxial master chronometer movements, I would class as, um, as in-house movements, despite the fact that they're made with a great deal of collaboration from the other, um, the other sections owned by the Swatch Group, um, because this movement doesn't share anything interchangeable with other watches um, and other, uh, other movements which are sold to other brands. Now, the first point I'd like to compare between in-house and third-party made movements is accuracy. And on the, uh, the third-party side of things, I feel accuracy is a very variable point. And I speak about this in, in this way because if we ignore modifications made by manufacturers to um, these third-party movements, so new springs and so on, the usual trend is that uh, an inexpensive movement is unlikely to keep accurate time, whilst more, more expensive or indeed simply more carefully prepared movements, do tend to keep better time. And so I'll explain this in terms of, uh, of the, the grades of movement, but also in terms of the way they're, they're prepared. Because generally a £400 watch using an ETA2824, for example, will be less likely to keep, keep a regular time than an ETA2824 that's been prepared by, for example, Zinn or Larco, 
um, for a thousand pounds, simply because more time has been taken in the assembly and more care has been taken in terms of putting the thing together with the greatest accuracy and the, the, the greatest attention to detail. And by this, I certainly don't mean to say that a £400 watch with an ETA2824 is not going to be a fantastic watch and can't be accurate. What I mean is that consistently, a more expensive watch where more time, more care and more attention has been put into them, the, the assembly and the preparation of the movement, you will more consistently get good timekeeping. And this is before looking into the changes of material that some brands do make, which I'll address in the, the section where I talk about uh, technology, because this is also a major factor when talking about movements and the comparison between ETA or, um, or for example, uh, Salita movements and a movement which has been made specifically by a manufacturer. The question of the accuracy of in-house movements, though, comes on to a few different factors. And the first factor is considering the price of the in-house movement. Because if you look at, for example, a Seiko movement, which is technically in-house, its specifications and in terms of its build and the time taken for a £200 watch, for example, will not be on the same standard as the in-house movement produced for, for example, a, a Tudor Pelagos. And the reason why I state this is because a lot of the accuracy which is associated with in-house movements is based very deeply upon the amount of money and the amount of, um, the amount of time and trouble that's been put into the movement itself. And so I'll use one of these Tudor MT5612 movements as an example. Now these are chronometer certified movements with a great deal of technology such as silicon springs, a balance bridge and, um, and variable inertia balance wheels. And so all of this technology that's been put into the movement and designed to work natively with the movement will naturally improve the, uh, the, the reliability of its timekeeping in terms of that balance bridge, for example, protecting the, the balance from shocks, and likewise the fact that the, um, the balance wheel, rather than changing the length of the spring, is controlled by the, um, the, the masses around its edge, will again help to prevent the watch from changing its timekeeping from that original chronometer certification. It should be noted, however, that a lot of, uh, of third-party movements, such as ETA or Salita movements, which have been carefully prepared and, cre and produced and assembled with a great deal of care by a really very, very experienced watchmaker, can keep just as good time as a, uh, a, modern, um, a modern chronometer with, uh, with a great deal of modern technology. And the reason for this is that a lot of the technologies that are added to these, these more modern movements are not particularly helpful or, uh, or, or noticeable in terms of their result during daily life. And of course this is because usually a watch won't be put under incredible strain where these differences would start to appear. And even so, a watch which has been, uh, been prepared with a great deal of care with a third party movement will allow for these, um, these changes and for example will have shock resistance and these other features which are, which are crucial. And so whilst the, um, the in-house movement does tend to show greater accuracy as a result of the care taken, one should really put this down to the amount of money and the amount of, uh, of attention that's been spent on the movement, as opposed to the fact that it is in fact in-house. Where the technology incorporated into these watches is concerned, one does have to accept that at the very pinnacle of technology, such as the, the real cutting-edge uh, watches, such as, for example, uh, Zenith's um, rather incredible um, new style of oscillator in their, uh, their limited edition of uh, 10 pieces uh, model, one does have to accept that this pinnacle of technology will only be available in, uh, in bespoke movements, so effectively in-house movements. And this is due to the nature of these technologies requiring a movement to be built around them effectively and not being able to be modified um, to fit into, for example, uh, an off-the-shelf movement. It should also be noted that for movements which are aiming for superlatives of technology, such as, for example, Omega's new line of master coaxial chronometers, where they're anti-magnetic to 15,000 gauss, the whole movement has to be redesigned to be able to incorporate the anti-magnetic anti uh, properties that these watches have. And so in that sense, a, a, a movement which is, uh, which is in-house will be able to incorporate more technologies in terms of modern touches than a modified um, off-the-shelf or modified um, third-party movement due to the nature of the fact that it's not built to initially take these technologies. However, it should be noted that a hell of a lot of money has to be thrown at one of these movements to be able to achieve these changes in the first place. And so I'd put forward a reasonable argument for the fact that at a more affordable um, price range, and this goes up um, higher than one might expect, up to four or five thousand pounds, you actually can fit a great deal of the technologies that would be available in an in-house movement into what would be conventionally seen as a third-party movement. Of course, a great deal of technology is able to be successfully produced with originally third-party movements. 
and a few examples do spring to mind, like for example the uh, the Zin um, uh, the Zin uh, 103 Diapal, where a uh, an, a Velger 7750 chronograph movement has been modified extensively to take um, Zin's um, uh, ultra low resistance and low friction uh, escapement in addition to a second time zone hour hand. Um, and of course this is uh, in addition to the fact that they use their own oils and a variety of other um, other adjustments to these watches, such as their argon interior to the case, in order to ex extend its life. But this really does show the fact that you are able to get some very impressive technologies with a movement which is theoretically off the shelf in terms of its design, though of course uh, each manufacturer, through the amount of care and time they take, is able to add more um, uh, more technology to it and also in terms of adding simply a greater level of quality to the movement, which really is seen at its peak in these sorts of watches. But similarly, in the case of watches like the Omega Seamaster 300M, that's to say the pre-2018 version, which uses the Omega 2500 caliber, and this caliber is based very closely on the ETA 2892, but it's been modified extensively and given their coaxial escapement, so that it has that uh, very clever um, resistance-free escapement, which allows much longer, uh, longer service intervals where the escapement is concerned. And so one really is still able to enjoy some very impressive technology with a, um, a third-party movement, as one would be with a, uh, an in-house movement, albeit without quite the same level of, um, of changes being made. Of course, when choosing between in-house and third-party movements, one does have to consider servicing. And servicing becomes a very major part of the ownership of any, any mechanical watch, bearing in mind that you need to have it serviced every three to seven years on average, depending upon, uh, upon uh, what the, the, the recommended uh, service interval is for the particular watch you're speaking about. But in terms of, of the way these, uh, the, these, these interact with the concept of in-house and, and third-party movements, this does depend quite, uh, quite significantly upon the manufacturer in, in uh, particular. Because if we start with, uh, with third-party movements, having, a, uh, having two watches, both with ETA 2824s serviced, may cost significantly different um, amounts of money, depending upon the manufacturer, and even more so depending upon the technologies which have been uh, added, or indeed changed, on these movements. However, as a general rule, mechanical movements which are based on third-party movements tend to be less expensive to service and tend to be much easier to service in terms of the, the individuals one can find who are experienced and are capable of acquiring the parts for these movements. And so this does pose a very significant aid to buying one of these watches, is that ownership in the long term may well be easier, especially in, in the very, very long term, when part supply of certain movements may dry out. Now, as a general rule, in-house movements do cost more, and this is down to various factors, though indeed there are exceptions to the rule, such as Nomos, for example, where their service prices, even for their in-house calibers, aren't uh, particularly elevated, especially when compared to other options on the market. However, if one looks um, purely at the, the most uh, well-recognised of, uh, of mechanical movements which are in-house, the price does tend to be greater for services, in addition to higher prices for individual parts if different bits need to be changed on the movement once it's been sent in. And this is down to various reasons, but uh, generally it's just because of the complexity of the movements, or down to the fact that the manufacturers of the parts withhold the parts, um, and so as a result you can't have, um, have stock ETA parts used to service one of these movements. They have to be the movement parts of the manufacturer, and so as a result the price does go up. One very major aspect of buying a mechanical watch has to be said to be that of the idea of complications and features. And whilst it's certainly true that you can get more from an in-house calibre, which I'll explain in a bit, in terms of the, the features, in terms of complications, there really is a lot on the market in terms of affordable watches with third-party movements that have been modified to a standard where they're able to offer a great deal on the dial. And one sees this with some of Oris's offerings, for example, where the base is a Salita automatic movement, but they've been able to fit a, a calendar with the, uh, the day, the date, uh, and indeed a 24-hour uh, marker, in addition to a moon phase from a movement which conventionally would be seen as a three-hand movement. And so this really does show the fact that a great deal is possible with an existing caliber, albeit not to the same complexity as some in-house offerings, but I think for a more reasonable price, you're still able to get a lot from a, a modified caliber. And so I feel that the, the difference between these two movements is perhaps derived from the price which is generally associated with each solution, as opposed to actually the solution itself. Of course, though, if you do want the absolute last word in complications, then of course in-house calibers will be the solution. 
And the reason for this is that because of the amount of money that's invested into these calibers, if you're looking towards uh, very high-end luxury movements, which would have this, these sorts of uh, complications, such as the likes of the models from Patek Philippe, then one's able to build the movement up in, in the, uh, the, the sole expectation that it will take all of these complications. And so one's able to have watches with uh, rather incredible sets of complications, such as a um, perpetual calendar chronograph with a moon phase. And whilst these movements are of course glorious, they are facilitated by the fact that they have a movement which has been designed from the ground up to accommodate these features. Although, as I said uh, previously, this is very much associated with the price, and so for the amount of money they're investing into these watches, they may as well invest into an in-house calibre where they can produce these, um, these features from scratch, as opposed to having to, um, to, to retrofit them to a movement which isn't originally designed to take them. However, at a lower price range, it does make sense to have a modified third-party calibre, on the basis that one's then able to focus the, the investment of money into the addition of functions, as opposed to, um, to having to engineer a movement from scratch, which of course isn't a problem when one's charging £100,000, say, for a watch, as opposed to £1,000. Now the final aspect of these movements I'd like to consider is their aesthetic quality. And the reason why I want to consider this is because the aesthetics, or just the sheer spectacle a movement makes through an exhibition case back, is often something which appeals to a great deal of buyers and watch lovers alike, because we all love to see a really clever or well-decorated movement. And I suppose you have to divide this into really two, uh, two sections. Because on the one hand, one is generally impressed by movement which is new, or something you haven't seen before. And in that regard, it can be great to be able to see a new in-house movement, because its shape, its form, its arrangement is totally new to the eye, and can look really quite impressive. However, luckily for those who like uh, well-decorated movements, and, uh, and don't want to spend an incredible amount of money, the choice of an in-house or a third-party movement is far less relevant to the question of how good a movement actually looks and how well decorated it is. Of course, if you go for a Petit Philippe movement or an Elang and Zona movement, which costs um, several tens of thousands of pounds, then of course the finishing and the decoration is excellent. But you don't need to spend this much to get excellent quality of finishing. And I'd use Chrono Swiss as a good example of this because this is a brand which uses, um, admittedly, some of its own movements, but to a great degree does use a lot of um, movements which are based on things like the Unitas 6497, 6498, but decorates them and skeletonizes them by hand to an incredible standard, which really does allow these movements to look incredible in terms of their design and their aesthetics and their build, which is something which doesn't rely upon them being in-house movements, but simply the fact that real care and real craftsmanship goes into decorating them. A similar example of this would be the Zin 910 SRS I got the opportunity to see at Baselworld this year, where one has a watch which uses what is at base of Eldridge 7750, but which is decorated extensively throughout its, uh, its exhibition case back and its view, whilst it's also given the addition of a flyback chronograph, as well as the fact that it also has a column wheel, and so one has a, a, an immediate change to the way the movement looks, and decoration which is thorough and really very beautiful with blued elements and, uh, and finishing throughout all of the visible surfaces of the movement, in addition to the technical charm of it. And so one's able to get a movement which is able to offer a great deal in terms of uh, satisfaction to the owner, which isn't necessarily in-house. And I think this is a rather nice place to end the video, because I feel I've covered the, the aspects which people generally ask about in-house movements. And so my final comments really about the question of what actually is better and whether a, a, an in-house movement is worth the extra money to something like a, a, a third-party ETA is that it depends on what you're after. Because you can get extremely beautiful movements, extremely well-specified movements, and movements which will, uh, will be serviceable and, and highly interesting in the form of third-party modified movements. But of course, if you want to reach into higher realms in terms of movements and, and in terms of complications, then the natural path to follow is that of the in-house movement, due to the sheer versatility of these pieces. But really, in-house movements aren't necessary, and I don't think they should be a, a be-all and end-all factor when you're buying a new watch. Really, one should judge a movement in terms of the features it offers, the quality of the manufacturing, and indeed simply the, um, the care the brand takes in preparing the movement and making sure it operates correctly. And so I'll conclude this video here, but do please tell me in the comments down below what you thought of my comments, and indeed my views towards this, uh, this, this debate of whether in-house movements are necessarily worth it, 
over um, a, a third party movement that's been modified or decorated or simply well prepared. And so if you did enjoy the video, then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel and also to be able to enjoy more videos and content here in future. So thank you very much for watching. This is Armin the Watch Guy, out.